Hello again, Gayan, and welcome to another edition of Budget in Focus. I am Malika Ramsey. Thank you very much for joining us for another edition. This time, we are speaking with the Minister of Public Telecommunications, the Honorable Kathy Hughes. Of course, some of you can recall that initially, uh, Minister Kathy Hughes would have been the Minister of Tourism. So we'll also be getting some sentiments from her a little later on in our discussion on the tourism sector. But for now, welcome to Budget in Focus, Minister Hughes. It's great to have you. Thank you, Malika. Okay. First off, Budget 2017. This is your sector aside, which of course is public telecommunications. What is the most positive aspect of Budget 2017 for you? Well, I am excited that Budget 2017 allows us to really begin to what I describe as transform Guyana. And, you know, as I said in my speech yesterday, for so many years, we've grown up hearing about this potential. And, you know, we've been stuck really in a traditional mode in terms of um, our high dependence on sugar, on rice, on traditional products, and of course our mining sector, that's very, very important. But the point is that a lot of what we want to do in terms of developing Guyana, in terms of transforming the country, I believe we can do by implementing the use of information communication technology. So that's the beauty about the Ministry of Public Telecommunications. As you know, uh, we were set up just in January of this year. Uh, it's a new ministry, and we have the exciting task of looking at how we do things in Guyana and how we can be more efficient, mm -hmm. how we can provide better services. And in terms of better services, I'm talking about the services that the government provides to citizens. And those services for, are, for example, when you have to go to the passport office to get a passport. Mm -hmm. And we know that recently we had a difficult time where we had thousands of people coming. People were lining up from 5 in the morning. And so the question is, how does the government of Guyana provide the service of getting a passport in a more efficient way? And again, if I use that as an example, Today you can download the passport form online, but you can't actually fill it in online. You can't send it into the passport office and have someone there check it and then send it back to you. And therefore, instead of you making two and three trips and waiting five hours, you don't have the opportunity to just make one visit, maybe to get your photograph and then the next time to pick up your passport. So the same thing goes for things like driver's license. Um, we have a challenge in that in so many parts of the country, you can't apply for a driver's license. You can't get it. You can't get your birth certificate. And I'm happy that we, in the Ministry of Public Telecommunications, we, we're developing that network, working with all the ministries, and we're setting a platform that we're going to be able to provide better services to the citizens. Okay, great. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that uh, a little later on in our discussion. Again, even before we go directly to your sector. Thus far, there's been much ventilated regarding the fact that some sections of society are using the um, VAT on electricity and the VAT on water to, in a sense, stir up sections of the public, you know, to make them feel that, look, this is a big negative. Your sentiments on the VAT on water and VAT on electricity. You know, that's a good point. And what distresses me is that I don't mind if you bring the facts. But sometimes we forget an important part of, of what the fact is. So G, um, GPL has put out public statements, and so has the minister responsibility. So we all know mm -hmm. that out of the 100-odd thousand customers that GPL has, 80% of them will not fall into the category of having to pay the increased tax once you go over that $10,000 threshold. So what we're saying is that, and, and similarly, if you look at the analogy with the water, I love the, I, I, it really, I began to understand when Minister Bulkan said, look at it this way. Mm -hmm. You would have to use 12 400 gallon um, bl big black tanks of water to get to the stage where you are consumed per month 
to get to the stage where you would be consuming so much water that you would need to pay the tax. And therefore, when you look at it in that way, the screaming and the shouting that poor people are going to suffer, um, you know, all Guyanese going to have to pay this tax, that is not the case. And the few people, in the case of water, that will have to pay the tax are, for example, the car washes, uh, maybe the hairdressers, of course, because depending on the size of the hairdresser, you may be using more water. And therefore, you know, there's an aspect to it. It's not the ideal situation, but even at home, we know we never have all the resources mm -hmm. that we want. We never have all the money that we would need. And therefore, the question is, how do we make the best of limited resources? And so in that context, for the big companies that are using way over, they are the ones that are going to have to pay. And those companies quite often are huge companies whose incomes far exceed anything the majority of the population can comprehend. And similarly, if you have a car wash and your business is using so much water, water is a precious resource. Imagine the pipes that have to be changed. Imagine the purification and everything. Mm -hmm. That really is the mainstay of your business. And therefore, we regret that we have to put a tax on, mm -hmm. but I think it comes with part of how you do business in that particular area. I, I want to say to people too that, you know, um, it's, it's, it is difficult when you consider the amount of money that needs to go into some of the sectors to keep them going. Mm -hmm. And here, I respect the contributions that sugar has made to our economy, but guess what? I lived in Jamaica in 1980. Mm -hmm. Jamaica in 1980 had started to close down their estates, and they had started a process of diversifying. They took a lot of their sugar workers and ensured that they started uh, developing other crops to plant. Um, right, and one of the things that Jamaica did very well is that they started to train uh, former sugar workers to get into ornamental and horticultural plants. So all those anthurium lilies, they started a project and they were exporting these flowers, growing them and exporting them to Holland and to you know many parts of Europe, and they were getting up to 150 US dollars uh, a plant. What I'm saying here is that Guyana as a country and as a Guyanese, I take blame and we all have to take blame that we didn't prepare for this sufficiently, that we didn't put a plan to diversify from the 1980s. And so how does that impact us today? This administration has paid over 30 billion, not million, over 30 billion dollars to Gaisuku to keep it going, to keep the sugar workers mm -hmm. in, in place. And therefore, I think that when you hear shouting and screaming that we're not committed to the sugar workers, we are. There is a plan f to start the diversification. But my point is, is that if it had started earlier, maybe we would not have spent 30 billion in the last 18 months. That 30 billion could have been used in so many other areas, you know? So that's the reality that we live with. Okay. Indeed, Minister. Just for a bit before we move on, I'd like to take you back to the water issue just for a bit. Um, how do you respond? Because, of course, there are some sections of society are saying, okay, look, this is the land of many waters. I mean, you did explain it. This is the land of many waters, and we still have to pay water. And um, there are others who are saying, well, when you go overseas, you have to pay all those taxes on everything. But then again, another group will say, will argue that, look, those are already big developed countries. So we have to pay the tax so that they can maintain a certain, uh, a certain level of development. How do you respond to sentiments like how, those? How do those countries become big and developed? Mm -hmm. Because the society is structured and governments and countries run on people having to contribute to be able to provide electricity, water, fix the roads, all the different costs, other than if you're having to borrow funds and bringing it into your economy, all the money that it takes to do all these different things that we take for granted has to come from revenue 
generated in the country. So it's okay to say that, yes, in the U.S., you know, you pay for water, yeah, but you've got a developed country. How do we begin to fix what we have mm -hmm. if we don't use the taxes that people pay to do just that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to be very honest with ourselves. We have a culture of thinking that, look, we don't, if we could get by, if we could do a little run-ins, you know, let me do mm -hmm. whatever, that is our culture. And it's a culture that doesn't help when you talk about developing a country. Um, you know, there's always been a criticism about the people that don't pay electricity. When people, if it costs a fixed amount of money to generate the electricity, the electricity company has to get that money back. And it means that if you got only 50% of the people paying electricity, paying for electricity, it means that those 50% really are paying for the entire 100%. And the question is, is that fair? Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about, and they were laughing in the, in, in the chamber yesterday about, oh, when you're soaping up, should you switch off the water? Guess what? I do that. Because and I don't see yeah. they meaning the opposition. Yeah, they make it as though it's so terrible to do that. I grew up with a mother that said, When you're soaping up, switch off the water. How much water are we wasting? You go through villages and down roads and people are filling up a bucket and the water overflowing for half an hour and forty five minutes. When do we become conscious of all of that? And how how does those wasted resources that have a cost, when do we start to ensure that that money, the cost of that water to produce that clean water that's running out in the bucket, when do we, we become conscious and understand that we're the ones long term that's suffering? And we have to pay more. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Minister, let's move on. Um, I did mention uh, to the viewers earlier, and uh, in a sense reminded them that earlier in the year, uh, Minister, uh, well, at the beginning of the APNU-AFC coalition government, Minister Hughes would have been the Minister of Tourism. This has been a very big year for Guyana. We celebrated our 50th independence anniversary in May. How has that um, highlighted, pushed, contributed to tourism, the tourism sector? Well, you know, I was very excited to serve as Minister of Tourism. Um, you know, I was thinking about it the other day, and, and Guyana is such a beautiful country that I took great pride in meeting people and telling them about this wonderful place. And I hope that Guyanese can understand um, the great things that we have in terms of tourism. We have a lot of infrastructure problems we've got to deal with. But really, the 50th anniversary for me was almost the, um, it was a celebration okay. of, uh, of our tourism product. And if you look at the statistics, close to 200, I think it's, a, it's something like 253,000 visitors had come to Guyana by July, by the end of July of uh, this year. A large number of those people actually came between the months of April mm -hmm. and July. And we know that because we had problems. Um, you'd go to a restaurant and it'll be packed. You'd have to wait. And you would be going down the streets and the coconut man would have a long line of people waiting for water coconuts. Mm -hmm. So we know we had, we had thousands of people that came and they had a good time. And prior to them coming, you know, just after we came into, um, into government, I had done a couple of trips to uh, North America, mainly the U.S., and we went to a couple of locations where we went to uh, Canada also, and we really bigged up Guyana. You know, we said to people, all this negative you got about your country and you ain't come back for 30 years, come back. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because at one of the shows, a lady came up to me and tapped me in the middle of Yellow Man singing, and she said to me, I know you ain't gonna remember me, but you came to Canada, and you told me I must come, I come. <laughs> you know, and I had to give her a hug. But that was the spirit mm -hmm. of our 50th anniversary celebration. People came from all walks of life, of all races, of all ages, 
I saw this old lady who could barely walk with her stool and she opened the stool and around her feet she had three young children and I figured it probably is her grand, her grands, you know, sitting there with her. So it was a special moment when that flag opened up. You heard the gas, you heard the sighs, you heard the hope for a new time in Guyana. And therefore, I think that we can't do anything else but build on that. We got a lot of international coverage. Of course, most recently, we're in the news internationally again because of Prince Harry's visit. I'll remind you that in January, uh, actually it was in December of last year, the best Christmas gift I got was Business UK saying that Guyana was one of, I think, 11 destinations in the whole world that you must visit and you must put on your bucket list. So we have um, hard decisions to make in terms of how we move Guyana forward. It's not always going to be easy, but I want to say that, you know, every good thing starts with a single step, huh? Greetings for Gyan, and we certainly are um, doing well based on uh, everything that the Honorable Catherine Hughes would have said thus far on this broadcast. Viewers, if you're now joining us, this is Budget in Focus, of course. So we're trying to remind you of all the positive things that the Budget 2017, the National Budget 2017, contains for our citizens. Minister, let's move on to your sector now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um, public telecommunications. Let's talk about, even before we talk about the achievements, the plans and so on moving forward, let's talk, let's get a brief synop synopsis of what would have happened in the, uh, since you took over the public telecommunications sector. And you can even focus on some of the challenges, which I know you will eventually beat. Thank you <laughs> for the words of encouragement. <laughs> um, yes, when I started, you know, we had to, first of all, look at establishing a ministry. Uh, in terms of designing a structure, uh, the staff that we would need, and in fact, we're hoping that come January, because it sounds, I can describe it in a couple of seconds, but imagine having to do all the job descriptions, looking at the areas. Um, one of the jumping off points for us was actually the um, public telecommunications, uh, the telecoms bill, and also the public utilities commission bill. Those were two bits of legislation that had been uh, languishing since 2012. And we recognized that to start to push the sector forward, we needed to have competition. So that's why we had to bring the bills to Parliament. We had to do our debates on the bill. And I'm happy to say that at the end of August, at the start of August, before we broke, uh, we were able to pass those two bills. Why is it important? Because previously, remember we had a, a monopoly in terms of telecommunications, in terms of our telecoms company. Digicel, for example, has a license only to operate in the mobile service. And therefore, uh, GT&T, GT and I must say we thank GT&T for their service. I see an important role for them in Guyana as we continue to expand. But we felt that some of the um, policies and expansion that we wanted to see meant that we wanted more competition in the sector. Technology is moving at a rapid rate. And therefore, uh, when we look at what this sector needs to do, the infrastructure that needs to be put in place, we recognize that we have to be able to connect all parts of Guyana um, on the internet. You know, the UN just the other day called the, the access to internet and the availability of internet in any country, in any part of that country, a human right. And what statistics have shown is that the more access uh, citizens in a country have to the internet, the higher the levels of GDP. And that's because once you can give stable telephone access, stable internet connectivity, then you leave it to the individual to decide how they're going to use it. They use it for online training and education. They use it maybe to set up a Facebook page to sell their tamarind balls or their hammocks. So the whole enterprising possibilities are there, not to mention so many other aspects. 
And so for us, the foundation has been bringing that legislation. It's been changed. We're about to set up a telecoms agency. And under the telecoms agency, we're now going to be able to regularize, issue licenses, um, give out increased spectrum so that the telecoms uh, companies can operate at a higher level. Some people will remember that in May, that was when I actually gave both Digicel and gt and some additional spectrum so they could start to move up uh, onto the 4G platform. And so once we could bring more competition in, imagine that there's some parts of the uh, hinterland where you cannot get a telephone signal. Some parts where if you have a Digicel phone, you're okay. If you have a, uh, a gt and phone, you're okay. But many places where you can't, not both companies provide service. So for the development of the hinterland, we need to know that anybody in any part of this country could use a cell phone and connect, family, friends, and everything else. Do you find that the public thus far would have gravitated, and, and when I say public, specifically um, persons, specifically uh, citizens in the public telecommunications business, do you find that they would have gravitated thus far and you would have gotten positive response regarding for the changes that you want to make? Absolutely. Uh, that's what keeps me going every day. I mean, as you could imagine, at the end of yesterday's parliamentary sitting, I thought to myself, oh, all this screaming and shouting and cussing down. But you know what keeps me going? The young people. And they text me all the time. They said, oh, Minister, guess what? The next thing you got to do is data protection program uh, legislation. Or you got to be able to do this next. Uh, Cybersecurity is another area. We had a hackathon that brought out some amazing apps. And I'm going to come back to that just now. But just to finish your point, so it's the legislation. And one of the things we started doing too is in mid last year, the e-government unit connected the government fiber optic network. The government actually always had, the former government had a fiber optic network built by the Chinese that we're paying a loan for on that was established since 2012. Uh, yes, and it was never connected. And that's how, that's the other fundamental thing that we had to do. The e-government unit, come uh, September of last year, started technically to connect it. And so in terms of providing the internet services along the coast, from um, as far as Springlands all the way to um, Pomeroon, uh, Esiguebo, that whole band, we've been able to put in place access to internet. So how does this impact the city and the country? We now can say with pride that we have connected 140 government and educational institutions. So secondary schools in the computer room now have internet. As you know, we also gave out, we changed on the uh, recommendation of the president, we changed the concept of the one laptop per family to one laptop per teacher. And so teachers, and I had the pleasure of going into Anai and I Shelton and a couple of places and actually giving out some of those uh, computers. So teachers now have computers, laptops, their own laptops that are pre-packaged with the curriculum, with um, some of the books they need, e-books, um, with all kinds of teaching aids on it. And so because we have connected that fiber optic cable, we are now being able to, we're now able to provide better internet service to government agencies. And that ties in nicely with the thrust of what we're going to be doing next year and I'll give you some figures in a, in a while. But a key component of what we're doing now is ensuring that in these government offices, in these uh, government agencies, there's free wireless internet access to r improve the level of service and to give customers in that space an opportunity to really be able to integrate with the technology and to be able to respond and have the services provided 
in a far safer, transparent, and a more efficient manner. So the thing that really excites me also is that we are going to create, and we've started to create quite a few, uh, internet um, ICT hubs. An ICT hub is a location in a region or in a village where there will be a space. And in that space, and I want to say that one of the things that we are looking at is using some of our post offices that are strategically located in the center of many villages and cities. And so in some cases, we're going to use the post office as the space. Now, those spaces, as we know with the post offices, they've been neglected for decades. Uh, you know, we apologize for the state that they're in, uh, but we're going to refurbish them. So imagine that you, in the future, by the end of next year, should be able to go to your local post office, and you should be able to sit down and have access to internet. What would you use that internet for? I'm not going to encourage you to come to the post office <laughs> and sit and talk on Facebook for three hours, but I would encourage you to fill in your app, driver's license application form, to fill in that passport form, if you're setting up a business and you need to go to um, Go Invest website, if you want to go, if you're thinking of importing or exporting and you need information from the Bureau of Statistics or wherever, any kind of government engagement, engagement with government services, we will give you a space, a computer, the access, a nice location free of cost. Depending on the size of that space, my vision is to expand it even more. And, you know, we recognize that in terms of education, which is where the technology and the con importance of connectivity comes into being, we recognize that in some of the hinterland areas, they don't have the teachers that we are fortunate to have in Georgetown. And we recognize that in some schools in Georgetown, we still don't have, you know, the number of teachers that we have. So this space can also be what we call an e-classroom, where if there is a, teach, a student at the Bina Hill Institute or five students in Anai that want to do biology, we can organize it so that they can sit in a space and be able to connect to a biology teacher that's teaching a class any other part of the country. And you know, we did a test run of this because we were at the Cyril Potter School when we launched the one laptop per teacher uh, program. And we had the Tain University campus, the UG campus. Everybody came into one location. The president was able to speak to them. They responded. So the technology is there. there. We and uh, we just need to utilize it. In the area of health, that's another critical area that I see the technology transforming what we do in Guyana. We don't have doctors in some of those remote hinterland communities. We know the stories of a woman that has complications in pregnancy or whatever, waiting or a day or two to get a seat on a plane to fly out. Mm -hmm. Or if they're in a riverine area, she takes this chance, she jumps in a speedboat and travels two hours down the Essequibo River. So this technology allows us to bring doctors to connect with health workers in previously unserved areas. Imagine and visualize that a patient can probably go to that center. Of course, we are looking at creating confidential spaces for these things that I'm explaining to you. Imagine that um, a health worker, a sick patient, can dial into a doctor or a specialist and he can see the patient, talk to the patient and immediately start to provide, um, you know, treatment. So the options are amazing. We are, in fact, I, I'd love to tell you sure, at this point in time, I'm right. picking up my notes so I give <laughs> you the exact figures uh, and it's quite exciting. Um, we have, our ministry got 1.58 billion dollars mm -hmm. and that's um, budgeted for 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 the the, the things I'm talking about Great. for the sector so 
114 million is allocated for the provision of internet access at over 600 government buildings across the country. Mm -hmm. So that money will ensure, as I said, we implement the technology, we put in the internet access, the equipment is there. So if you're in Lethem and you don't have internet or service on your phone, you will know the places you could run to, to do whatever gov government service you need to do. An, uh, an estimated 90 million is going to be used to provide ICT access specifically for the hinterland, mm -hmm. uh, poor and remote communities. And we've, we've created that special group because we recognize that there are a subset that have been neglected over the years. So we're targeting those. Exactly. We're not dealing with the people in Lethem that have big business and got money. No. Mm -hmm. We are looking out for our citizens that fit into this area. And so, as I said, we would be creating those ICT hubs. And, and let me give you an idea of some of the places that we've already started with. We've got Massacanary, Anai, Lethem, Waramadang, Paramakatoy, I Shelton, St. Cuthbert's Mission, Linden, Bartica, Madia, Mabaruma, Port Kaichuma, Kwikwani. And we've started there. And in fact, we are starting also, that's for the hinterland part of the project. But we're also doing 30 pilots also that are going to serve, we anticipate, about 60,000 residents. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's more ICT hubs. And those are going to be in places, for example, Region 2, in Affiance, under Neeming, Lima Sands, Region 3, Lenora, the Namsel, um, Parfait Harmony, 4 in uh, Agricola, Mocha, Arcadia, Edmore, Bath Settlement, Ithaca, uh, in Region 6 in Wim, Firish, Varakara, Skeldon. So I'm giving you an idea of the range of places. And so we're starting with you know, two, three, four, five, six, because they're the larger population centers. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to get to them there. No, yeah. Right, with mm -hmm. the cable that I mentioned to you, the fiber optic cable that we have. Yes. Uh, so that's why we started with them. But eventually, we will go to one, seven, eight, nine, and the other areas. So the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that we have, um, you would probably know, that unfortunately, Ghana as a country um, under the last administration wasted $1.3 billion yeah. in a fiber optic cable that we wanted to implement. Why is that so important? Because the connectivity I've talked about mm -hmm. is along the coast. But we have nothing that goes from Georgetown area to Diamond. Look at the size of the population in Diamond. Yeah. It's and it's growing. There's nothing from Diamond to Tamari. There's no cable that goes from Tamari to Latham, mm -hmm. to Anai, and to all these different other areas. So one of the things that we felt very strongly is that we can't talk about this vision of connecting, and we don't have a cable that can bring the access, the internet access. So there are two things that we're doing. We're actually working very closely with both uh, telecoms companies because they have uh, service into some areas. So we can establish a relationship with them, support their business, give them some, you know, some, some business, and they assist us in providing connectivity. And in other areas, we have put aside $435 million, and that is to ensure that we can expand this government network, the fiber to the areas I've mentioned that we don't have out of the coastland. And there are a couple of things. So that would include the expansion to Tamari, Amelia's Ward, Diamond. And then, of course, we have some funds for, you know, 50 million, for example, for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a big thing. And I know that's where you're, this is, I think this is another one of your loves, the hackathon, Guyana, yes, the first yes. hackathon. We can't, we can't so. <laughs> And then, of course, we there's some funds in here, mm -hmm. 275 million for the maintenance of that network. Okay. Um, so I think really that 
I hope gives you an idea of the things we want to, we've started to do mm -hmm. and what we want to do. So um, next year, I think that more and more places of, in Guyana are going to be connected to each other. We're connecting ministries to each other. We're mm -hmm. connecting citizens to ministries and to services. And then communities to communities. Uh, to communities, to, exactly. Yes, really and truly. And, and I am happy for that outline, that detailed outline, line, and I'm sure that the viewers are too, because it really and truly gives an understanding as to where you plan to take, which is still a relatively new ministry for us because we're now focusing on um, developing uh, telecommunic the telecommunication sector. You talked, you even gave figures. One of the things that the Honorable um, Minister of Finance, Winston Jordan, would have mentioned in budget, in presenting budget 2017, would have also been the National Information and Communication Technology Strategy. Let's talk about how that will play a role in terms of bringing together all of these things that you talked about, Minister. Yeah. Well, a lot of, um, I think in my explanation, I've actually kind of given you the specifics the outcomes of the strategy. But um, I have to start off by saying that we haven't completed the development of the overall policy, meaning that there isn't a policy that um, I could hand to you and say, this is it. I've described it to you. But certainly what we want to do is to create a digital government, meaning that we want to ensure that instead of having records from the 1800s at the minister at the registry mm -hmm. that you're frightened to turn the page because it's breaking up we want to make sure that our records our transactions mm -hmm. everything we do is done digitally as a government okay. private sector businesses do that uh, today some of the bigger ones but we have to start the government thinking that way so our mandate is to ensure that we put all the things, the training, the education, the infrastructure, the equipment that makes that possible. And here when we talk about the government, we're talking about all the agencies. Um, connected to that and connected to one of the overarching things we, we hope to start working on is the whole concept of a smart Guyana which is another exciting project in the ministry because, you know, there's a safe city uh, project that the Ministry of Public Security has started. And the beauty of this uh, project, and I saw how it works on my recent visit to China. Imagine that you have the technology today that uh, a policeman on his bike could be driving around with a little phone attached to the bike that has internet access. Imagine there's a command center that has monitors and is monitoring every city, every corner. Mm -hmm. Imagine that a lot of those corners have um, cameras. We have some of it already in place in Guyana. And therefore, any aspect of crime, somebody robs somebody in no time, they can actually communicate with each other because the police commissioner is connected, the ambulance is connected, the policeman on the bike, the one that's in the car, the person that's close to the area. And so it is easy to be notified. We just had a robbery on Main Street. There's an officer right round the corner on Lamaha Street. He gets an alert to turn around. You understand the vision I'm trying to create. And therefore, the technology, again, in the safe city concept is being used all the time, 24-7, to keep us safe. We're having challenges right now. But I am confident that as that, um, and IDB is funding part of a, pro a pro project with that, as it unfolds more, we will begin to reap the benefits. Part of that, that safe city is just one part of the whole Smart Guyana project. Imagine that in that same project, we're going to be able to connect all the different people and services. We're going to be able to have a component for education, for citizens to be able to talk back. It's almost as if you have a giant website. And instead of you having to go to 10 different websites before, 
you can go to one place and you would be able to decide, well, oh goodness, I want to make a report about a broken water main or guess what, I need to go to get my passport application in this direction. I just, there's a police, there's a robbery taking place right next door so I can be channeled into the safe city police side of it, uh, the medical side. Um, so it really is exciting, it the, like you know, the project that we're building. And opening up our world um, a little bigger. Minister, we're coming down to uh, wrap up time, but of course, we can't possibly wrap up this discussion without talking about the hackathon. And I did call it earlier, as you, you touched on it earlier, I did call it um, one of maybe your other babies, one of your new babies. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that first experience for you and what Guyanese can expect in future experiences and preparations and hosting of the hackathon. So we held the hackathon really to, uh, to get a sense of the, um, the technical, the, the people, the young people especially that are out there that are already doing things in the ICT field. And for me, it was one of the most encouraging things this, this year because it really allowed me to network more with young players in the industry that are doing remarkable things. So under the hackathon, we gave them a 48 hours to come up with an app or some kind of application that would be a solution to a specific problem. And just briefly, I will mention that one of the apps that came, they came up with, for example, was an app that allowed farmers, and I should say that each of these applications that can be downloaded on a phone or your computer each of them, we are in the new year going to connect with the right people so they can become real living applications that can be used by the citizens in Guyana. So one of them was uh, for farmers. Quite often, we, there are international markets or regional markets for a range of products. And the challenge is that farmers have the land. They're producing one thing, but there may be a glut on, for cucumbers. And quite often it's a hit and miss as to what I should be producing when. Imagine if farmers had a, an application on their phone that specifically in real time gave them an idea of what they should be planting. And planting because there's an existing market right then and there waiting to pick it up. So, um, you know, I, I like to tell the story of hearing just recently that the fastest growing food chain in North America is polio tropical and polio tropical cannot get enough planting. I mean, you know, the whole promotion of Asian and Spanish and ethnic uh, cuisine is a big thing there now. Imagine if our farmers are able to know that, wow, a man in Miami needs a hundred thousand pounds of planting. So I could tap into him. I could speak to him directly and he and I could start to do business and I could get on my merry way producing plantains to meet that market. So that's really very good. We have a terrible problem with um, having to pay our pensioners still with physical cash. I think we forget that so many areas within the hinterland, it doesn't make sense for uh, some of those communities for their residents to come out once a month to collect their pension. Mm -hmm. They might come twice a year because they travel for three or four days and they may spend a, almost the size of the pension yeah, to get to there. Get to so we really do need to get to a stage where we have an electronic payment system. And that was the other thing that one of the groups developed, a very interesting way where instead, very similar to the mobile money, um, systems that are very popular in Kenya and in India and it's a way that we need to go especially when it comes to security our personal security and walking around with millions of dollars so I, I mention all of this to really highlight that young people are doing great things we have to give them the opportunity um, there are about five apps that were produced in the new year we're going to take it to another level so they can be practical examples and a lot of the things that we are doing, we are looking to them 
to give us the deliverables. I want to use this time to also mention that in that context, the private, se the private sector itself can find a lot of the solutions to their problems and to some of what the services that they provide from these same innovative young people. You tell them the problem, they will find the solution. And I want to thank them for really, really energizing me. I, I've enjoyed meeting all the different groups. Uh, Minister Hughes and this conversation has certainly energized me and I'm looking forward um, to benefiting from all of those great things um, that you outlined and we expect to come from the public telecommunications sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Viewers, of course, this has been a discussion with the Minister of Public Telecommunications, the Honorable Catherine Hughes. Most of you just simply know her as Kathy Hughes. This is Budget in Focus. Coming up in a bit, you will hear some of the sentiments from Minister of State, the Honorable Joseph Harmon, on Budget 2017. Stay tuned. I would wish to say that the Budget 2017-2017 is a budget that focuses on restructuring the base of this country to make it ready for the developments which are going to take place. In particular, the green economy and greening of Guyana. Um, these structures which are necessary will have to be um, focused on. And in this regard, I want to say that the public sector will receive a huge amount of money in this budget to ensure that they are prepared to provide the quality of public service that will be necessary in this green pathway that we are embracing on. Now, in the present context, we have had the opposition screaming murder, suicide, and all these violent things that they speak about that this budget will produce. But what I want to say is that this is an opposition that is accustomed to scaring people. And it has to do not so much with the interests which they have about the Guyanese people, but more so their own political survival in an environment where their support base continues to dwindle because of the excellent work that is being done by the AP and new AFC um, coalition government. All across the country, people are seeing the development work that is taking place. And in this 2017 budget, they will recognize that that work will be continued all across the country. And therefore, the lives of ordinary people in this country will be better. This quality of life, this good life that we speak about in a diversified economy is something that is real. I have had cause to say in my delivery in the budget speech itself that what we are doing here is that we are moving the green pathway from from concept to reality, that what is happening now in 2017 is the reality, is that people will have a better understanding when we speak about green energy, when we speak about green tourism, when we speak about green education, it is that people have now going to be reorganized themselves the way in which they treat with, with power, the way in which you treat with electricity, the way in which you treat with water, the way in which we treat with all the issues as it relates to the daily lives, that it means that we will have to live in a better, more conservative framework, and that in that way, we will prepare ourselves for the future which beckons 2017 and beyond. That's the first thing. The second thing is that because the opposition is in this, um, this uh, campaign mode, this Congress mode, they have gone on to make some very irrational statements, in my view, in the National Assembly, in the intent of scaring people. Guyanese people, however, are, in my view, much more educated than that. And they can see beyond the narrow politicizing of these issues in the budget by the PPP. Who would forget that at the time of the debate on the, the countering the financing of terrorism and the anti-money laundering bill, that the people went all across this country 
telling people doom and gloom that if the measures that they had proposed were not passed, that if you money coming from the United States of America, if it's coming from anywhere, the little remittances, all that gone. That, that if you walk around as a contractor with $2 million or more, that the law allow for the, a police officer, they're going to seize your money. And so all of these things that the whole place was going to shut down. But we have lived through that. And we have lived through the lie of the PPP. We are aware that even during the time of the debate on the Amaila Falls hydro project, that two issues came to the National Assembly to be debated. One had to do with raising the debt ceiling for the government to borrow money. And the other one had to do with the extension of the water reserve that is have to be preserved for the, for the falls. And this was because the environmental agency discovered that there were some rare species of fish discovered in that water so that they had to extend the reserve of, for that water. So those were the two issues which came to the, to the parliament to be debated. The Amila Falls project was never placed on the agenda of this National Assembly to be debated. And because we said in the National Assembly that we were not convinced by the government's explanation at that time, that we were not prepared to support what they had put there on the table, they went on to say that the opposition killed Amila Falls. Well, the world knows that that was not the case, that the Amila Falls as a project was never placed before the National Assembly. And this kind of myth, this, this spinning of facts, it has gone internationally and it has affected the way a number of people see the governments and the opposition at that time, our response to the Amila Falls. So it is another matter which will come up very shortly and upon which we will have a lot of discussion and I will speak um, much more extensively on that matter. But at the time, the opposition went all across the country saying, oh Lord, we're going to have total blackout, that there's no, um, that oh, we are fighting against renewable energy, we're fighting against um, hydropower. We made it very clear that we were in support of hydropower, but that we had a serious issue with the manner in which this project was configured. We never had the financials about this project, Neither did we have the technical specifications about it. And I can say this, until now, today, even while we're in government, that the PPP held on to those documents. And it was only through international connections that we were able to see snippets of the project. So that when people talk about scaring people, when they talk about violence and all of these things, this is what the PPP is known for. And so I want to say to my fellow Guyanese, do not be fooled by these by the people who predict doom and gloom. Guyana is on a virtual pathway to prosperity. And it is that prosperity that they feel threatened by because once people are educated, once people are prosperous, they don't have time for people who tell them all sorts of nonsense. They don't have time for them. And it is really what the PP is trying to do, is trying to remain relevant. 2017 and beyond, will prove the relevance of some political ideas and some political thoughts. We are on a path of developing this country, and we are developing Guyana for all Guyanese. This is about a good life for all Guyanese, including those who are in the diaspora that want to come back home. We welcome them, because this is really what we're talking about, developing all of Guyana. We don't have enough people in this country to develop it. And so all our brothers and sisters who are all across the world this is a budget that is basically not just for the people here, it's but for all of Guyana. When we speak of all of Guyana, we speak also to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Come home and be part of this exciting time which we're having here in this country. We're going to make this country the, the shining star of the region. Let me say a little bit more about our own positioning in this region. Every day, in fact, on the day when the Minister of Finance announced and did make his budget presentation, on that day, we had 227 businessmen
from Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname here in Guyana to look at business opportunities here. 227. We have people from Barbados, Jamaica, all over the region. They are coming here. They are seeing something. They are seeing that this here, this is the future of the region. And here in Guyana, we have to understand our position and let us work with the government to make sure that we can deliver. That when those people come, they see investment opportunities, they take advantage of it so that the Guyanese, the lives of our Guyanese brothers and sisters can be improved. And this, as I said, is for all of Guyana. In the infrastructure program, we're spending a huge amount of money, billions of dollars, to link the coast with the hinterland. And in so doing, what we will be doing, we'll be freeing up a lot of the natural resources of the country, make it more accessible for our people to go there. I look forward to the day when I can jump in my car in Georgetown and drive to Letem, or drive to Kaitan, or drive to Kamarang. Those are the days. You can drive in your park on the weekend, you, you stop at the lodge, you spend the night there, and you move on. This is what Guyana is beckoning. This is what is on the horizon. And I, I feel compelled to say that the opposition should understand that and sharing this vision of prosperity. And I believe that once we can do that, we'll have a better debate in the National Assembly because we'll be debating on issues and ideas and not just about the, the trivia sometimes that takes place that passes for debate. Thank you. <laughs>